Hey friends, Josh here with the Dude Facts Podcast. Heads up that some of our normal audio clips and music doesn't show up on this week's recording. So you might hear some awkward silences or weird places where we're laughing or just some of the normal things you hear aren't going to be in this episode. But listen away, there's still great content and we hope you enjoy. So what does the Bible say about divorce? Why are Christian divorce rates so high? Is it okay for a Christian to remarry after they've been divorced? That's our discussion today on the Dude Facts Podcast. Welcome to the Dude Facts Podcast. We're four guys, a church planner in the Pacific Northwest, an army chaplain, an equity plan management analyst, and a connections pastor, whatever that is. In the past, we all served in youth ministry together. In the present, we create weekly podcast episodes dealing with ministry, church life, and pop culture. And in the future, well, we're going to be the cool granddad that tells his grandkids to pull his finger. If you love Jesus, Java, and corny jokes, you're going to fit right in. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of joe, and enjoy this week's episode of the Dude Facts Podcast. <laughs> Really? Well, 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 once in a blue moon, you get all four dude Woo-hoo. factors back. Nice so reference. It is a foursome again, yes, and we just had a blue moon <laughs> last night. So uh, welcome to the show. We are on the second episode of our series, What Does the Bible Say About Blank? Today, we're talking about divorce, which obviously is, especially here in the United States, I think a topic that's very relative and uh, hits all of our churches, um, impacts it definitely, and uh, ministry that goes on in our churches. So we're going to get into that topic in the second half of the show. But first, we have some pretty incredible things to talk about. And so you need to stick around and hear this. So the University of Austin P. Let's go P. That's my, alma, my alma mater, Ryan's alma mater. Grant, you went there for a a while, right? For a whole year. For a whole year. <laughs> Grant, so, did you have a shirt? That was to enough. Show us your P Ness. My P Ness. N E S S. So supposedly, wasn't there like a football player, basketball player with the last name of Fly? Yes, yep. James Fly Williams yeah. was his nickname. Because there was some some phrase like "the flies open, let's go pee." Yes. <laughs> yeah. But are you old enough to have? seen bob dole when he was at austin p and hold up a sign that says let's go pee with bob dole (laughs) remember that (laughs) were there trophy urinals back then yes there are in the football stadium no lie hey (laughs) what's cool about austin p that's here in clarksville um you know the clv where uh three of us live and uh, grant used to live here so he knows all about this place so there is an Austin P professor that has helped produce a new Hollywood movie. And I think you guys are going to want to see this one. I know I want to see it just in time for the fall season, the Halloween season. We have the movie Slaughter House. Oh, yeah, baby. A sorority house <laughs> takes in a wild sloth who turns out to be a murderous killer in this dramatic thriller. And if you watch the preview, there's a scene in which a girl is getting in the shower and a sloth appears to slash her with a loofah, which I don't know how that happens. But, I mean, it is a movie about a sloth that is not only murdering people, but stalking people on the Internet, making like a Facebook profile. So he's highly intelligent. Um, But this is the only highbrow entertainment you get when you deal with Austin P and uh, I think I'm ready to go see this movie about a killer sloth. What about you guys? I, I think that sounds like a great premise. Is it, is it going to air after Sharknado? So it's in theaters. It's actually playing at Opry Mills in Nashville tonight. Oh my gosh. Just tonight? So we, we should leave and stop recording the <laughs> podcast and let's go. Is it just tonight it's playing? No, I think it's in theaters for a while. Uh, Dude Facts Road Trip. Yeah. <sighs> Wearing well, our t-shirts. And Slaughterhouse. <laughs> Are you going to be in town anytime soon, Grant? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> well, the church but, fly you over here. <laughs> guys, I have a really important meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have two questions, though. Sure. Number one, documentary? No, this is the oh, real deal. okay. Like movie. <laughs> And then number two, what in the world does this professor teach? <laughs> I can only hope like biology. Or which or professor? Filmmaking. Which professor was it? Did it say? It the news article did say, but I I honestly didn't dig into it enough. I was, I wondering, got too if, I was wondering if it was somebody that was there at my time in the comm department. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But just in case you're wondering what kind of sounds a sloth makes, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> is that the sound it makes the after it, like as it's killing someone <laughs> i think so i, I only can hope it, that that just just terrifying. if anyone was listening to that last segment or this segment without headphones in <laughs> and you want to bring your spouse in to explain what you just heard again that was a sloth <laughs> that's right or hopefully you weren't listening to that at like the drive through at Starbucks or something like that. <laughs> in your you're at work at right church. now. If, if you're at work right now, crank up your speakers. Because here you go. <laughs> oh. I I just would like to say that you know, great things to come out of the Austin P Com department. <laughs> Slaughterhouse yeah. and Dude Facts could be argued now. That's right. Half of Dude Facts yeah. came out of the Austin P. Com department. That's right. See, you see, we're producing this and uh, Slaughterhouse. Yep. So, w- w- would you guys be scared of a killer sloth? I think I could get away. That's the thing. <laughs> Maybe for a second, and then, like, wait, it's a sloth. He's way over there. Yeah. I got 30 I was- minutes. I was disappointed hearing the name that it wasn't Sloth from the Goonies. Mm. <laughs> Probably a hey, you guys. Yeah, would have made more sense. If you go to YouTube, there is a sneak peek scene, and uh, the Sloth roofies a girl, and she passes out on the floor, and uh, then he just keeps appearing in random places in her room. And, Why don't they call uh, it Floris? <laughs> <laughs> they should, because I mean, she's on the floor. But uh, eventually, the sloth ends up over her with its sharp, like whatever. It sounds like a calls. like a mystical sloth, almost. Yes. <laughs> we have teleports. I think so too, and it's only PG thirteen, so it's, oh, it's fun yeah. for the whole family. Yeah, IMAX. whole family. Yeah, as I long as they're over thirteen. <laughs> But I'm with you, Grant. I think I could get away from the killer sloth. I, I I don't know if I'd be afraid. I mean, if it's coming after me with a knife, I think I just, you know, casually walk away and it's never going to catch me. Yeah. But if you're asleep <laughs> and it's, at, you know, on the loose in your house, that could be dangerous. Yeah. Or, you know, distracted by taking a shower, apparently. That's true. Especially if he has access to your loofah. Yeah. I mean, he can hide things, razor blades, box cutters. It, it must have been like one of those like exfoliating loofahs that at least has a little abrasiveness to it. If he's... A loofah is just hiding the knife. It's like inside of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just for this guy. I miss it. it I, oh, so I would make him a loof to the loofah. Bring me a loofah. Yeah, she thought that the, the loofah, or she thought the sloth was just trying to like scrub her back, and then he yeah. like all of a sudden cutting her. <laughs> oh, he's friendly. <laughs> I need some exfoliation. Too much, too much, too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Yeah, I I think we've got to see this sloth movie. I mean, we we got to go represent the nine three one, and uh, you know. Get out there, see some high quality entertainment. And uh, I think, if anything, we should have known about this earlier so that we could have partnered somehow and we could have got a sneak preview. Maybe we could have had an ad before the movie. I'm sure he's probably got an ad before the movie. So. We could be wearing Slother House t shirts. Yeah. I was disappointed Man. to just hear about it this morning. 
honestly. They missed a great opportunity. They did. They did. So okay, killer I do have sloths, to say. Yes, get out there, see it. Um, if anything, I, what's funny is from what I've read, it's actually getting good reviews. So mm. this actually might be a good movie. <laughs> from I'm sure it's though. probably one of those comedy <laughs> Um, horrors, and so uh, you have to know what you're getting into. But uh, is it on yeah. IMDb? It is. It's on IMDb. Did you look up its rating there to see? I did. It was like a seven point five out of ten. Really? Yep. <laughs> Granted, maybe only three people have seen it so yeah, far, the, but and they're probably. I mean, you think who are the people that would go see that movie? Yeah. And that's where the ratings are coming from. Yeah. I I read one guy who said. You know, obviously, it's not a serious horror movie. It's one of those that you go into, you know, almost as a comedy. But it does great at what you would expect a killer sloth movie to uh, provide. So, yeah. <laughs> so speaking like, of providing, the sloth looks like a raccoon, though. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> it's almost like a like a hedgehog, too. Yeah. <laughs> Did they train a real sloth, or we? going cgi here i i hope they did train a real sloth so. i hope it's a little person oh yeah i was just somebody in a sloth suit <laughs> <laughs> oh, i advocate for little people i i really i hope they get as much employment opportunities as anyone and uh i hope a normal size actor doesn't take away the opportunity to have played the sloth from a little person yeah yep that's right. I hear little people are actually angry about the whole Snow White thing. That because they got rid of the dwarves. They, seriously, because they yeah. got rid of the dwarves. Because it took yeah, away an opportunity for them to have it's representation. Like Snow White and what? It's the woodland creatures or something. <laughs> Bunch of what's up with that? Weird characters. I mean, mixed gender. Mm. Yeah, between that and Hugh Grant taking the Oompa Loompa role. It's not a, oh, not yeah. a good year for no. little Extras. people in movies. That's right. Hopefully, <laughs> the Slother House is making mm -hmm. up for that. We can only hope. We can only hope. All right. We have something exciting for you. It's your <laughs> comments right now. <laughs> yeah. All right, Ryan. It's such a, it's such a good intro. I love it. Um, all right, so a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of talking on the socials and some on YouTube, some good stuff. So I'll just dive right into it. So um, yeah. last week we talked about some uh, some would you rather situations, and I think the main one was uh, was it would you rather laugh at sad things or cry when you're happy? When Something someone like that. tells a joke, or isn't that what what it was? Yeah. Would you rather be someone who compulsively laughs during sad situations, yeah, yeah, yeah. or somebody who compulsively cries? Um, so uh, we had a couple couple comments on that. So uh, Tyler said, "This is a no win situation." So I'd rather laugh than cry, <laughs> which I think is a valid valid response there. <laughs> Never if you don't, good, if you know. if you don't want uh, the taste of salt in your mouth from your tears, you laugh instead. Uh, and then Ethan said, "My grandfather actually laughs during sad moments because he can't handle the sadness. He's done that at one funeral that I know of, and it was his dad's. So, <laughs> Yikes. If there's any funeral to do that at. It's definitely." Your own parents. Your own dads, yeah. Um, I mean, I've been at funerals where they've told jokes. <laughs> so. At least you could maybe play it off. You're like, I was just thinking of something funny he said. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Oh, so on YouTube, Tyler also said, uh, would you rather spend a year on Shroot Farms or babysit Angel's cat for six months? <laughs> the way that Dwight babysat her cat? I could do that. <laughs> yeah. Feed a over. bunch of antihistamines yeah. and throw it in the freezer. Just drug it and throw it in the freezer. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. All right. So yeah. Some good stuff there. Uh. Let's see. 
Let's find some. So, um, last week we talked about, um, is, uh, you know, we talked about alcohol. That was, you know, what, what does the Bible say about alcohol? Well, on our teaser for that on TikTok, um, we had some, uh, some good, good, uh, you know, comments on that. So one person, uh, blacked out quotes, just said, what's the answer, which if you're (laughs) watching this and listen, you you know, go back and watch last week's episode. That's how you find the answer. We don't, we don't just give the everything up. The answer. <laughs> We're not going to help you out, lazy. <laughs> you got to sit through all hour and a half, two hours of this podcast to find the answer. That's right. Which I was it. so bummed that I missed. I, I just really so badly wanted to say liquor. I hardly know her. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so to go on some a couple of se- more serious responses to our episode last week. So, uh, Jordan Jordan Music on TikTok said, yeah. "I'm a Christian, and I think it's fine to drink in moderation. I choose not to because it's far healthier to not. I was drinking three to four beers a week, and just from stopping, I lost twenty pounds and sleep way better." Which I do think is a is a valid point, you know, health health wise, you know. Twenty pounds. Just how large were those beers he was drinking a week? Yeah. <laughs> Big German steins. That does make me think of Andy on Parks and Rec, where he's like, where it's you know after Chris Pratt has done the first uh, Guardians of the Galaxy movie, and then he comes on, and he's like, yeah, I just stopped drinking beer, and he's like, how much beer were you drinking? <laughs> um. And then uh, another comment from Tyler on our YouTube video. Um, so Tyler said, uh, something about me is that my mom's side of the family uh, are Baptist and my dad's side of the family are Catholics. So I always had mixed opinions on whether drinking alcohol <laughs> was good or not. Uh, dad's side would drink a lot while my mom's side would drink not so much. For me, I don't think it's bad drinking alcohol. However, once it starts affecting your life, for example, driving drunk affects work, changes who you are as a person. And then I think there's definitely a problem with it. I had it definitely in there, but, um, but for me, um, I'm more of a casual drinker. Like I might have a beer at dinner. I might have a couple of drinks at happy hour event or go to a brewery with friends. I think alcohol is judged too harshly. And some reasons I understand um, because people abuse it, but other people that casually drink, I don't think there's a problem with it, but that's just my quick take on it, quick which, take. um, yeah. appreciate your thoughts. There, Tyler. <laughs> Tyler, you stop <laughs> drinking, you can lose 20 pounds. That's true. Yeah. Immediately <laughs> you stop it and it's just like falls off you. Yeah. Maybe, and Oh, maybe he's British and he lost $20. Yeah. You know oh, that. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, sorry, dude. <laughs> a couple drinks at happy hour and something with dinner. That might be more than casual. <laughs> I, I'm thinking Every those day. are separate occasions, not yeah, all of them. Like one, one like one after the other. But <laughs> it's like people who say I drink religiously. You know, once or twice, usually around the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, uh, Ethan uh commented on youtube um just said i would like to see a topic on should christians play D D, magic the gathering or other mystical worldly things that might be connected to that and what scripture says on it which i think we have talked about a little bit in the past um which you know we talked about i got big old dungeons and dragons tattoo right there so you know, I so Ryan, you're our resident and D&D, uh, expert. So. I've also got, I bought this, uh, I bought a pack of uh, Lord of the Rings magic cards. So they did like a special Lord of the Rings edition. That yeah, I but that was token, of. so it's... Yeah. <laughs> it cancels it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's our token <laughs> dork. <laughs> um, yeah, we, I mean, we could definitely talk about something like that in the future if we, uh, if we're... Yeah, I'm sure we would all have a lot yeah, to we say. Would just have to sit back and be like, all right, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, explain. I've got a whole shelf. If you go to my living room, I've got I've got shelves up, and there's just there's Dungeons and Dragons like rule books and 
player guides and, you know, books on how to create monsters and different campaigns. And then, uh, just like dice and stuff, stuff everywhere. All is that, in the house. Is that the same room where you do your seances? And, yeah, you know, exactly. I'll pull out the tarot cards. Board. Should Christians play with a Ouija board? <laughs> well, let's consult our Ouija board. <laughs> yes. Actually, funny thing about Ouija boards. So, um, I, you know, uh, Brenda, my wife jokes with me a lot about Ouija boards because I don't, I don't believe that Ouija boards actually do anything. I think that the, the superstition that gets put on them is a little ridiculous. And I, I think they're just, you know, harmless really. But at the same time, I don't mess with them because just on the off chance that they're not, I don't want to, I don't want to take that risk, you know, and I feel like that's a, a valid stance. <laughs> <laughs> that's true but maybe maybe so maybe we could do an episode that centers around the type of entertainment that christians you know what does the bible say about entertainment and yeah. it can involve some of those classic uh things i think that the church has preached against you know mm -hmm. whether it be like dungeons and dragons or harry potter or, or whatever twilight um, I'm sure we could. Yeah, Twilight. Did, uh, oh. did the church rail against Twilight? Uh, a church in my hometown did. They were very aggressive against Twilight and Harry Potter. Sometimes New the same moon. time. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you about an old moon. Yeah. Yeah, from way back in back history. I love the way that you said history in that video. History. History. <laughs> history. Baptist history. That's how, that's how Baptists talk about history. Yeah. History. <laughs> Well, uh, so those are the comments, Ryan. Any other yeah. uh, good no, comments? No, so that's, that that's our there? comments. Um, again, please, uh, please throw them out there. It was some good stuff this week. You know, we, we always want to hear your thoughts. If you, yeah. we we like you responding to the, the the fun stuff, but also if you got any thoughts on the on the topic and what we talked about yeah. or something you want to hear in the future, you know, drop it drop it to us. We'll definitely. Maybe we should have a account. commenter of the week. Ooh. And. Uh, you know, I I think Tyler and Ethan are like going at it this week. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, we're gonna have to maybe uh maybe not an award, but we'll at least mention their name. Yeah, <laughs> like, congratulations. So there there was I don't know if this was a comment. I think it might have been a private message. Um, Tad responded to the video on perms. Oh yeah. Oh. In the, I think it was in the Facebook. He like DM'd our Facebook page, and uh, he said that he had the perm. When yes. He got married. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Ted, Ted, Ted. He was like, "What's wrong with perms?" <laughs> and I, and I Just the perm, or did he have the mullet as well? I'm jumping in there. I can't remember. Josh, you gonna try to pull up that? There uh, it is. Oh, you got the picture? Oh yeah. Oh, it was a picture. Oh my Let's gosh. Take a look at this bad boy. Oh, oh baby, man. Oh. Yeah. Uh, with the mustache that's what makes love it, it. So he sent another one oh yeah got it out of his iraq camaro straight to his wedding yeah <laughs> t-tops uh, off sporting a perm at his wedding in 1987 oh yeah yeah mm. buddy yeah listening to some reo speed wagon <laughs> there you are tad you're Woo! here's your moment of fame legend so the guy on the left has the mullet Mm -hmm. and Tad's got the perm. That's true. Man. Yeah. So that's a good combo. I like it. You know what time it is on his watch? What time? Party time. <laughs> <laughs> a little better close up than just a tad. Oh yeah. <laughs> his face. What are you thinking about, Tad? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks yep. for sharing that, Tad. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that is. <laughs> I was like, that my was new uh, loved getting permed. So, you know, anytime I was over at like a family event or something with them, there was always times that she was getting a perm in the kitchen and it stunk. Oh, man. Getting a perm <laughs> in the kitchen. Yeah. Like, like my aunt would be doing a perm for her in the kitchen and, and just made the whole house stink. I bet. Like, like I, I've been to salons where they're doing perms and they Oh, just, it's the they, worst they smell. Stink. It's so bad. Yeah. My wife is a youth pastor. Like she here. hates them. So <laughs> there's a youth pastor in Portland whose wife got a perm, and he, within the first maybe year of their marriage, I'm not going to say who it was, but I guess the first time he saw her after she got a perm was, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know if they're still married. <laughs> <laughs> it's on topic. Rest in peace, Bob Barker. It is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he died. Oh, Bobby. Oh, Bobby boy. Yep. Yep. Priceless. Hey, and shout out to all you people that ripped off the, he made it close to 100 without going over joke. Uh, man, I saw that from so many people. Yeah, Not everywhere. Like just taking it as their own. You know, like, yeah, like, like three days after like they the first thought one of went it. Out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I think he may have done it on purpose, probably mm. just as an ode to the price is right <laughs> to himself. That, that really was the, the thing I would say about that is that really was the stay home from school sick, like mm. starter pack. Mm. I mean, it was watching mm. the price is right drinking like ginger ale mm -hmm. and uh just sitting there in my scooby-doo underwear and immediately after him. young and the restless comes on <laughs> and then seeing guys celebrate that they're not the father <laughs> well i think uh that sound means it's time for something we've missed mm. it's grant's dad joke so what you got for us today grant well, I got a doozy, so <laughs> hold your horses for for this one. <laughs> Is it going to be a long one? <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. Okay, shark walks in. <clears throat> shark walks into a bar, and the bartender says, "What can I get you?" The shark says, "I'll take a Bloody Mary or a fish bowl, whatever's funnier for a shark to be drinking." So the bartender says. I think the fishbowl is funnier, but isn't it weird for you to be drinking all alone? And the shark says, not after the day I've had today. So the bartender says, well, if you don't mind me asking, what happened? The shark says, I, I lost a patient. So the bartender replies, I am so sorry to hear that. It must be so hard being a nurse shark. And the shark says, nurse shark? I'm a doctor. Did you think I was a nurse shark because I was a woman? And the bartender says, no, no, no. I just thought that, you know, that was the type of shark you are. You're a nurse shark. And the shark says, I am a great white, sir. And the bartender's like, well, you don't have to go and get all racist about the whole thing. And the shark says, racist? Some of my best friends are black tips. And the bartender responds, Black tips. Whoa, isn't that a highly aggressive breed? And the shark says, yeah, and I'm the racist? So the bartender says, listen, we got off on the wrong foot. I don't want to make your day any worse than it already is. This is on the house. And person to person, I hope you know that what happened today with your patient is not your fault. And the shark says, well, I kind of ate him, so it definitely was. So the bartender says, well, that actually works out because the kitchen's closed and it closed at midnight. And the shark says, wait a minute, you stopped serving food in the middle of being open? And the bartender says, well, yeah, I mean, we don't eat late at night like you guys. And the shark says, see, this is why I don't go to bars like this. And the bartender says, well, where do you normally drink? And the shark says, I don't know, mostly sandbars. <laughs> the jokes in the middle of that were better than the final yeah. <laughs> I kept waiting for like which one was going to be the punchline <laughs> and that's why that one's so funny <laughs> that deserves so many point. sound effects yeah. <laughs> yes. so layered making up for lost time that's right. I yeah, it's so, I mean, I mean, all the social all the... like commentary in that, you know. Mm. It's yeah. Pretty, pretty deep joke. I think so. And and you really hit some of the things we've been talking about on the podcast because mm. we had a huge Drinking. Uh, <laughs> podcast on race. Yeah. <laughs> who who what about white white people uh what they order at Mexican restaurants. So Oh, Grant, so it's not you missed that one. What's the whitest thing that people can order at Mexican restaurants? Are you asking what sounds the whitest or what white people order the most that makes yeah. them seem very most. white? <laughs> yeah, like the least. Probably offensive. white girls ordering margaritas. Oh, we didn't even talk okay. about that. But 
that covers Argies. alcohol because a Dos Equis would be more Mexican. I am I'm a white guy, so I order two X's. <laughs> <laughs> Most interesting man in the world. <laughs> I don't always have two X's. <laughs> I like it. So well, you have like a food item that's a very white person thing to eat? Probably Taco Bell. Okay. Anything? Just all of Taco Bell? Yeah, all of Taco Bell. Well, man, a Mexican pizza. Ooh. Mm. So I, I thought the bell burger was the the most white thing on that menu. Yeah, that was all. So we figured out. <laughs> Jeff found a uh, a graphic during the week, um, and he sent it to us. Maybe you can show it here. That's an yeah, an, an old vintage Taco Bell menu, and they have a bell burger. The bell burger, yeah. But they used to have. I hamburgers. forgot. I I don't even remember ever seeing that. It makes more sense. Didn't, didn't we talk about like a uh, like a old man trying to order a burger at a Taco Bell? I yeah. Feel like I, I, I just maybe that's why that. he was trying to order one because he was like, oh, yep. he used to have them. I know you had the bell burger. <laughs> I like how it had all the pronunciations on there. Yeah, taco. <laughs> so you can make sure to pronounce <laughs> it authentically while you're reading off the menu. Yeah. Burrito. <laughs> Before Spanish became like such oh, a mainline secondary language here in the U.S. Looking Hola, me gusta uno pizza. Here you go. Yeah, bell burger. Yeah, so taco burrito. Frijoles. Burrito. Frijoles. Frijoles, tostada, and the bell burger. What's the uh, <laughs> description of the bell burger? <laughs> the bell burger, quality ground beef with crisp lettuce. Wrong already. Onions. There was no quality ground beef at Taco And Taco Bell. Bell's own famous sauce served on a fresh hamburger bun. <laughs> I would just like I, to say I that, like that there's only six items. It's simple. Yeah. I hate going to Taco Bell now, and there's like 3,000 items and 28 <sighs> different combos, and none of them make sense. I miss the That's why I love In and Out. Yes, In and Out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can get In and Out and then eat, and it goes In and Out. That's right. <laughs> the best of an enchilada. And combination burrito topped with mild red sauce, cheese, and mm. olives. A meal in itself. Take it home. It's reheatable. The hey, oh, gosh. Can you read it again? <laughs> I'll do the tostada. <laughs> Mexican-style beans. Crisp lettuce and shredded cheese heaped uh. on a tasty corn tortilla. Oh, Served yeah. Famous Taco Bell sauce. Why did that get so loud in the middle of that? <laughs> I was just waiting for you to whisper, live mas. <laughs> <laughs> Near that. I was seeing if any of these sounded really Oh, yeah, you need the good. chihuahua. Yeah, you remember the chihuahua? I miss that guy. He oh, was delicious. The, the, the frijoles. In a chalupa. That's good. Refried pinto beans whipped to a smooth texture. And accented with wild <laughs> red chili sauce and shredded cheese. Oh, baby. Taco Bell. Mm. I'm going to have to get some Taco Bell. This is making me hungry. <laughs> I know. I'm, hungry. I'm making you hungry. <laughs> I have to go get I some authentic Taco oh, Bell. Oh. Sounding really good. Yeah. <laughs> well, Josh has a surprise for us tonight, guys. I do. New segment. Here we go. What you got, Josh? So... I figured we needed to add a segment and what got me thinking this way was seeing something on social after the last week or two. So this is our new newest segment called conspiracy theory. Maybe we need a better name. So I have my tinfoil hat on. I wanted to share with you guys a conspiracy theory that I heard about in the last week or two. And it's in regards to the, the wildfire wildfire uh, in Maui. And um, Grant, I before I really get into this, does this kind of hit home for you? Like seeing all that, did it really make you sad? No, I grew up on Oahu. That's okay, fine. Good. Were they like your <laughs> no offense, people? Lahaina people? <laughs> no, it's just a bunch of tourists, okay. more so than Oahu. Yeah. So the conspiracy theory is this: that uh, the news is saying that the wildfire wildfire started from some sort of electrical short somewhere or something along those lines. But the truth apparently is that th 
the government is testing a directed energy weapon mm. and they decided to test it on Maui so that there could be a land grab by the government elite and celebrities. And so there was a article, just a screenshot of an article that was put out that says, why are from, from apparently October of last year, why are celebrities painting all of their Maui houses an odd color of blue? And the thought is that, that this directed energy weapon would catch anything on fire except things that are that color. And so now there are videos that are out um, <laughs> showing umbrellas that are blue that haven't been burnt, but everything around them has. Mm -hmm. Or um, there's a house, this famous house that you see on Maui that's burned all around it, but the house hasn't been burned. It has a Oprah's. red roof, but it has a blue car parked in the driveway. Mm -hmm. So apparently this is what's going on. And, and there are some videos that have uh, circulated where you see this beam of light coming out of the sky and then hitting something on the ground that then explodes into fire. And there's two videos like this. Well, the unfortunate thing is that the article, um, the screenshot of this article is actually from a, um, a magazine that, <coughs> that was released last year, an article, but about interior colors where celebrities were painting their, their houses blue on the inside. And this included Oprah, the Obamas, um, the Clintons, Tom Hanks, Ellen DeGeneres, Kid Rock, they all have houses in Maui and they decided to, on the inside, paint it blue, not the outside. And then these videos that were used um, were from previous news stories and the beam of light, and they were covering different fires, or whatever, and the beam of light is lens glare. So, if you're hearing this conspiracy, there's some holes in it, but maybe not. So to be on the safe side, guys, get out, paint your houses blue. Ooh. Have you guys heard that conspiracy theory? It sounds like Passover. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. Heard this before. Or it sounds like Blue's Clues. So here's, here's what I want us to do. I should have said this at the beginning. I want us to rate this conspiracy theory on a scale of one flat earth to five flat earths. Mm. One flat earth means, yeah, it's a stupid conspiracy. No way. Five flat earths. All right. There might be some validity to this. So as you guys have heard about this conspiracy, what's your thought? One flat earth to five flat earths. I might have to say two because the fact that, uh, who did that? <laughs> <laughs> Conspiracy of who did that? Somebody later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I think was real. That's no conspiracy. But I, I, I think any conspiracy that claims that Kid Rock was involved, mm. <laughs> to me, automatically gets disqualified a little bit. Because I don't think he is in that, um, in that circle of people. Mm. Although he was drinking a Bud Light the other day after okay. shooting Bud Light. So okay. I, I don't know Kid Rock anymore. He might not be able to know who he is. Yeah, may, maybe he is playing us all. He was drinking some gender fluid? He was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grant, what would you what would be your rating from one to five dollars? I have to say two because part of my brain goes to most of the land in Hawaii – at least on Oahu, was ceded. So you couldn't ever own the land. Uh, even if you owned your mortgage, paid off your mortgage completely, the land is ceded. So the at least uh, the county could claim eminent domain at any time. So part of me just wants to say, yeah, it's a bunch of crock. But historically in Hawaii, when there have been natural disasters, rich investors swoop in and buy up land from native peoples. So there's some of that. Mm, so let me give it a two. Little chance okay yeah have, right. have you seen saved by the bell hawaiian style <laughs> no very eerie <laughs> saved by the taco bell <laughs> yeah. all right Ryan. Border. Uh, so in a similar vein to grant i think i'm gonna say a three but three. because not not necessarily i don't i don't think that the uh the whole like energy weapon thing is necessarily valid but i do know it is proven 
that our government loves to take land from people. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, I think that's totally plausible <laughs> that they could be doing that. <laughs> can, can I do, can I plug something though? Yeah. So there's one church. It's kind of crazy how God works sometimes. There's a Lahaina Baptist church. It was one of the very few buildings unaffected. Uh, the pastor was, is there, he's an interim. So he just retired, but he took an interim pastor position in Lahaina because he's a smart dude. Um, and they thought it was all gone. His name's Barry. He's from the Northwest, like a super solid dude. Um, so how cool that God could like save this one church because our, uh, the Southern Baptist convention is actually really good about disaster relief. So that church is going to turn into like a great show, uh, place for getting food and clothes and having, uh, uh, people there to care for people as they move back in. Uh, and it happens to be a kind of a buddy pastor in that church. So that's kind of cool. So you can like look up, uh, Lahaina Baptist church, um, or I think it's the Hawaii Baptist convention and then follow their link to disaster relief. Um, it's actually money going to people who need it, not governments or celebrities. Mm. Yes. Well, yeah. then it's definitely a five flat earth because we know how much the government loves Southern Baptist. Yes. So they would. Have <laughs> I was going right. to say, thank goodness it wasn't Joel Osteen's church because wouldn't be getting nothing for the community. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. He's going towards his new private plane. <laughs> <laughs> or in another bathroom behind a toilet. <laughs> Crazy plumber story. Yeah. Stocking money way in the walls. Well, I personally like uh, Josh wearing a tinfoil hat, so um, I look forward to that segment uh, continuing, and uh, we hope you continue with us as we get into the second part of the Dude Facts podcast, as we'll be talking about divorce and uh, what the Bible says about it and uh, what uh, Christians should think about it as we uh, talk about our experiences. But before we get to that serious discussion, let me leave you with this. Mexican-style beans with mild red or spicy green chili sauce, shredded cheese, and onions folded in a soft flour tortilla. Burrito. <laughs> the <Okay>. mas. <laughs> It's just playing over and over. When do we get a, a South Park sound clip? <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. We'll see you on the second part. Go get some Taco Bell. All right, welcome to part two of episode 28 of the Dude Facts podcast. Our discussion this episode is on what does the Bible say about divorce and remarriage? We're going to look into that as well. A lot of questions out there. One, what does the Bible say? Um, is it a mortal sin to divorce? What about uh, if you want to remarry? Is that allowed? Uh, and is the divorce rate inside the church just as high as it is in the general population? And if so, why? And if not, why is that such a popular statement out there? We're going to look at that in our conversation. So um, as you guys know, we uh, we like to cut jokes and have fun. And so something like that might come out, you know, as we, I'm sure it will. Somebody will make a joke about something. But divorce is a serious topic. And um, but we want to still approach it in a way that uh, doesn't just bring you down the whole time. So, um, and cause we know probably a lot of our listeners have parents who are divorced. Maybe you have, uh, divorced, um, your spouse at some point, maybe you've remarried, your parents have, we just know it's a, it's a topic that affects a lot of people. Um, and, uh, in fact, um, you know, just doing some research and this is something we all know uh, about 50% of marriages today, uh, end in divorce. So it's definitely something that affects a lot of people either, You've gone through it or you know somebody who has or, or, or who has faced it, it. Is that in the United States or is that worldwide? Um, that's These are U.S. stats okay. uh, that I'm going to give um, to us. In fact, just so you know, the U.S. is one of the uh, – has one of the highest divorce, rate, divorce rates. It's not the highest country, but the lowest is actually uh, Sri Lanka. No. So, just so you know. Um, What's the population of Sri Lanka? Yeah. Um, 
if you divorce probably her. or yeah decapitated or yeah. something flogged yeah so notable. his cap was detated <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, well, I tell you what, before we get into that, any of you guys um, have parents who have divorced or in that grant your parents have? Word. Word. How old were you? <laughs> yeah. I was, well, the legal separation happened after my first year of college. So right after that year at Austin oh, P. Wow. And then they actually signed, I think Penn went on paper my second freshman year at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. So I was like 19 or 20. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure it was something very surprising, or did it, was it something you maybe saw coming? Or Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty rough for sure. a long time in their marriage. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you feel I don't like think anyone was surprised. Yeah. Do you feel like it was more difficult going through it at that age or are you kind of glad you were older when i was super glad i was older because i just stayed up in chicago and worked every summer uh, which is a lot of fun uh yeah i have, I have a younger sister and she was more in the middle of of things but mm. yeah i was very grateful and that's one of the things i know we're talking about the bible what the bible says about divorce but mm. you know i think it would it it would behoove us to to mention that you know divorce it's not only obviously the couple that is impacted mm-hmm. it's the family obviously mm-hmm. but the ripple effect and so i think that's why as we look at what the bible says about it that's why it's so important to not just i mean obviously always look at the bible as this is what god has commanded this is what he's teaching but specifically here th- these are not suggestions or god being harsh he is seeing the ripple effect mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. what it does to the family. And mm-hmm. uh, he's, he's warning against it. And that's why the commands are the way they are. So mm-hmm. before we ju- jump in too deep, let me just share some stats on divorce. And most of these are uh, current with 2023. Uh, so uh, like we said earlier, the divorce rate in America for just the general population is somewhere between 40 and 50%, depending on what, study you look at for second marriages the divorce rate is 60 to 67 percent and third marriages is 73 percent uh which is kind of crazy um only six percent of couples who divorce actually get back together um i i don't know if i would have thought that would have been higher or lower um uh, but i think it's interesting that there is at least a percentage that like hey let's let's make this thing work um the percentage of men that get remarried is 64% and 52% for women, which I think makes complete sense. Um, cause men are like, okay, I can't do this on my own. I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to pay the bills. I don't do laundry. And women are like, oh, I just don't need a man. I mean, they're, yeah. they're stupid. I mean, men are basically helpless yeah. alone. Yeah, we are. We get it. It's the way it is. <laughs> right. Um, so this is interesting from, In the year 2000, the divorce rate was eight couples out of every out of every 1,000 marriages ended in a divorce. Eight out of every 1,000. In 2020, that had dropped um, to uh, six in every 1,000. So because courts closed. Do what? Because courts closed in 2020. That's right. Well, this is what's interesting. So they couldn't go anywhere. The uh, the the, the other stat to that is that marriages decline drastically. The amount of people getting married declined yeah. drastically between those years. But the numbers have gone back up since 2020. And like you see the graph just ticking back up. And that's during COVID, right? So people are together all the time. They don't have the break for work or whatever. A lot of stress, a lot of financial issues uh, in marriage or in, in families' homes. And that has led to increased divorce rates since 2020. Uh, reasons for divorce. Do you guys want to think of what the number one reason is? Any thought what that might be? Is it money? Money. Money. So money is pretty high. Um, okay. In the list, that's 37% of divorces are because mm-hmm. of money. But there's a few things even higher than that. Hmm. Infidelity. Infidelity is number two at 60%. I thought oh. that would be number one. Yeah, I would have thought that too. 75% is cited as just a lack of commitment. 
Oh wow! Yeah. I'm well, like, work that out beforehand. Duh. Yeah, yeah. I think that is that a hundred percent is emblematic of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> the How is that not one hundred percent of couples are lacking yeah, commitment? Who are all of them are lacking commitment. Uh, so, um, general conflict is fifty eight percent. Abuse is twenty four percent. Religious mm. differences are thirteen percent. Wow. Um, and no premarital education or counseling is thirteen percent. So um, that's why your pastors are saying get counseling. Um, the highest state for divorce is Nevada or Nevada, depending on how you pronounce it. Nevada. Um, yeah, so Probably the most it, rushed marriages as well. Yeah, and, <laughs> and actually the, the reason behind that is because they have very laxed rules for marriages and divorces there, right? Mm. Uh, you think of Las Vegas and wedding cha chapels everywhere. Uh, Massachusetts is the least – uh, at least amount of divorces, um, but they also have the highest average age of couples getting married is mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. Tennessee is somewhere right in the it's middle. Wicked. Yeah. Wicked also. Wicked smart. Um, now, how about them is, apples? <laughs> this is interesting. When you see that uh, Nevada has the highest rate of divorce um, for a state, the number one occupation for getting divorced is being a gaming manager. So these are the people who work at casinos, <laughs> who are the managers on the floor. 52% of gaming managers, uh, their marriage will end up in divorce. Their uh, whole life is a gamble. That's right. It's just a roll <laughs> of the dice. Number two is bartender at 52%. Number three is flight attendant at 50%. Makes and sense. then gaming workers. So those who are actually <laughs> working the tables are 50%. So it makes a lot of... Oh, not gamers. Not gamers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm, keep playing Fortnite, Jeff. The gamers <laughs> don't get married. They live in the parents' All of them. All of them. So just a few more here. We love you, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but if you guys ever have uh, start having problems, let me know. We've got a counselor at our church. Um, so the lowest. I thought this was very interesting. Um, what do you guys think might be the lowest? Probably occupation. monks. Who took a vow of celibacy? <laughs> yeah, priest. Um, so clergy is number four, fourth lowest at twenty percent. Yeah, the, clergy. The lowest, that's right. Represent. Uh, there's only one out of five of pastors getting divorced. That's good. The Does that include people who never got married? Do what? Does that include people who never got married? In the yeah, first is that including oh, priests? Yeah. <laughs> It'd have to. I, I really hope it. I really hope it. Doesn't. doesn't. Yeah, I had to think. The, the, well, the number is more meaningful if it doesn't include that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the occupation with the lowest divorce rate is an actuary, which I think is just hilarious. <laughs> that is I hilarious. Mean, that they're t calculating all the risk. It's and, like the opposite of a gaming. Yeah. Game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all risk with a game. Let's game think about rate. this. Yeah. <laughs> it's very logical. And then let me just talk about the the Christian thing for just a second. So, because mm -hmm. I've always heard that um, the marriage rate within the church is just as high as outside of the church. And so there was a um, uh, a study done by uh, the Barna Group back in the, the early 2000s, and they came out with that number. So more research has been done kind of since then to clarify it a little bit. Um, it's actually if you if you divide people into categories of those who attend church and uh, nominal are active in pursuing their faith yeah, yeah. against those who attend church who attend church and are not active in pursuing their faith or you would say those who identify as christian and are active in pursuing their faith and those who identify as christian and are not this, this is a pretty interesting stat so 30 percent of those who identify I'm sorry, those who identify and engage in their faith is 30%. So the average population is 50% Christians who are pursuing their kind of pursuing their faith, they say, or who say they are, it's 30%. But for those who identify as Christians and don't pursue their faith, their divorce rate is 20% or a divorce is 20% more likely than the general population. Oh, wow. So you're 20% more likely to get divorced if you identify as a Christian, but you're not doing anything to actively pursue that, um, which I, I thought was pretty wild um, that 
it, and it's, you know, probably just because you've got a false sense of having everything together and being okay. Um, but you're more likely to divorce. So I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> All right. So uh, it's something that is around. It's something that people deal with. Um, but the question is, what does the Bible say about divorce? Or how should Christians view it? Um, anybody want to kick us off in this um, as far as what the Bible might say? Because it's pretty straightforward. Grant, what, what would you say? If someone asked you, <laughs> I'm going to go to, go to the pastor. Hey, oh, goodness. Pastor Grant, what does the Bible say about divorce? What, how would you answer that? Uh, it is something that, I mean, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, <laughs> who doesn't like it. Um, Malachi 2.16. That's mm -hmm. what I have. That's kind of the foundational yeah. thought. Mm -hmm. But then there's, you know... But God allows ways out of certain situations. It's just, I mean, it was even starting from the beginning, I mean, there's Adam and Eve. And even during their fall, um, you know, Satan kind of drove that wedge between them with what God said and what they were obeying and not obeying with that one command, the one thing they couldn't do. And then the very next generation, uh, the kids start killing each other. So the family has been, the family unit has been fractured since the very, very beginning. Um, and that's against God's plan. And so I think that's why he hates, I think it's important to understand like, that's why he hates it. Cause a family that functions really well is so good. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we can so quickly run to the rules about what we shouldn't do opposed to trying to thrive as God's beloved possessions, his children. So I think like understanding, like it's so good to have a functioning family unit where the mom loves Jesus and her husband. And the father loves Jesus and his wife and the kids uh, love Jesus and their parents. Like so much good comes from that situation for generations. Um, opposed to don't do this, <laughs> but God does hate it. <laughs> yeah. So, but you had a, you made an interesting statement there that he allows it though. Mm -hmm. Cause there's also a thought out there. Um, I think it's primarily in Catholicism that, um, it, isn't it that divorce is like a mortal sin? Um, I may be getting that wrong now that we're recording and I'm thinking more clearly <laughs> that may, I'm going to have to look that up while we're talking. Um, so, but God ha is allowing it. He has allowed it. Uh, you know, there is a, um, I think it's out of Deuteronomy. There's some teaching there of being able to offer a certificate of divorce. So does that him him allowing it, does that really mean he, he hate, like, wh why did he do that? If, if it's something he, we're, we're told he hates, but yet he's allowing it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's that balance? I think part of it is he knows that, you know, obviously what his intention is that what he's joined together, let no one separate, no, no man separate, but he also recognizes these are two sinful people entering into a relationship together. And uh, sometimes those individuals, because of sin in their life and their family, can cause more harm being together than, um, you know, them just getting divorced or separating. And uh, obviously, I think God recognizes that, not that he likes it. And, uh, you know, as Grant pointed out earlier from that verse in Malachi, he hates divorce, but... Um, he also, um, you know, I think is a God who, who protects and, uh, obviously wants to, um, you know, it, we talked about divorce impacting, um, watch over those who, um, you know, are impacted by this and, uh, you know, get people away from sin and draw them to him. And so I think sometimes being in that relationship itself can be, um, a breeding ground for sin, and it's got to be uh, something that is uh, separated. Hmm. Yeah, we mentioned it earlier when we were talking about prices, right? And I, I kind of mentioned the, the uh, Jerry Springer show. I made that reference. So I, I think about divorce every Christmas season, uh, not only because that Ricky Bobby two Christmases quote, but <laughs> We forget that uh, you know Joseph was seeking to actually divorce Mary, 
I mean, divorce is something that, that God, um, you know, very personally relates to. Uh, you know, in our culture, and for many years, it's been a ring's on a girl's finger. She's engaged, but she can take that ring off and she's not engaged. But, you know, there, there was a contractual obligation in the first century in Israel among Jewish people. And Joseph and Mary were contractually engaged uh, to be married sure. and breaking that engagement yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and to break out of that, it was called a divorce. It would be a fracturing of those families that had come together. So I like to say that Jesus, it's like Jesus took a step out of heaven, the heavenly realms onto the set of the Jerry Springer show, because <laughs> God literally sent an angel to tell Joseph that he's not the father, but to stay together for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Merry Christmas, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and just let me interject. Um, yeah, divorce is not a mortal sin. I apologize. <laughs> I miss. I w- I don't know why that was on my mind. Um, but it is. Yeah, I think my parents are alive. Grave. Say it again. I think my parents are still alive. Yeah. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it is considered a grave offense, mm-hmm. and the Catholic Church does not recognize it because it's a lifelong commitment. So, kudos yeah. to them on that. And my apologies mm-hmm. to any. That might have be a Catholic and think I, I don't know. That's all bad. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I, I to kind of echo or you know uh, on Jeff's point about you know that because of the nature of humanity, we are sinful people entering into this you know relationship of marriage. There is a possibility for irreconcilable differences on one or both parties that you know, can be so detrimental to other people that, you know, I think allowing for that reality of just humanity, I think is a big part of why, you know, there is this allowance for something that, you know, God does hate it, but he also understands that, you know, because we, we are imperfect, therefore the, relationships can be imperfect and that, you know, we, we can enter into them in imperfect manner. And that's, it's not, you know, as clear clear cut and dry as, you know, God joined this. So not let nothing separate it because sometimes just because two people are married doesn't necessarily mean that they're joined with God. Yeah. So then when is it allowed? So, cause we, I mean, and Je- so Jeff mentioned this earlier, it, you know, um, Matthew nineteen eight is where we hear that the allowance was given because of the hardness of God's heart, or I'm sorry, the hardness of man's heart. God knew it would happen. So certain reasons. So you got two imperfect people coming together, right? Um, and uh, it, it, you know, I've heard it said at weddings that, you know, marriage is the union of two sinners who are going to try to live together in harmony. And the only way you do that is through hard work, um, definitely the help of the Holy Spirit if you're a Christian couple. But there's fights, there's disagreements, there's things that happen. So at what point do you maybe hit that line where there would be kind of like, like is is it, does God view it like, okay, it's allowed in all situations, right? You you just don't get along or you disagree on how to make mashed potatoes because my wife does it out of a box and I grew up where it was actual potatoes mashed and we've worked mm. through that. That's why we've been married for 20 <laughs> something years. But like, wh- where, where's that line then? Um, where is it something that God would say, okay, this is something where I don't like it, but I get it. And there's some freedom to move on. Well, scripture mentions, um, you know, Paul writes in first Corinthians that, a believer who is abandoned by an unbelieving spouse is not bound to them. And then Jesus in um, Matthew, that Matthew 19, Matthew five, uh, five. talks about sexual immorality. Um, and, and that's a whole nother discussion. You know, as we talk about sexual immorality, well, what does that mean? Is it just cheating or does pornography other, other ways as we talk about sexual immorality uh, come into the picture, but um You know, at least in terms of dissolving the marriage, there seems to be, um, you know, guidance or allowance given. The remarrying after that is is another can of worms. I'm sure we'll get to that. But as far as uh, dissolving of the marriage, you know, being abandoned by an unbelieving spouse and sexual immorality seem to be two that are talked about in Scripture. It's almost like you don't really see 
Go okay. ahead, Ryan. I was just going to say that it's almost like there's there's not a hard line stance of like this is where it's okay and this is where it's not. It's but you know, in reference to those pieces of scripture that Jeff mentioned, you know, there there is this kind of guideline of like these are the type of offenses that are you know that would justify this. So is there a gray area then? Like, I think there's gray area examples. I mean, think about like Hosea mm-hmm. staying married. <laughs> yeah. And some would argue that that was not, I think they're dumb, but some would argue that that didn't actually happen. That was an illustration for how God loves Israel, which might be true, but I think it also actually happened. But, and then you see the wisest man in the world is Solomon, right? The wisest man to ever exist, we would think biblically. Yet he had how many wives? So at least he's being obedient and not divorcing. Yeah. He's just adding, right? No yeah. subtracting, just adding. But he got his punishment because however many wives he had, that's how many mothers in law he had. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Debbie. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you just have one. And it's great to have one. Yeah. <laughs> I have two. It's amazing to have two because Bridget. You have two mothers in laws? Yeah, oh, Bridget's- got it. Got Bridget's it. parents yeah. divorced when she was 10 and um, dad remarried. Mm. Oh, um, I was going to say she has two moms. Yeah, my two moms. <laughs> <That's what> was... <laughs> Either that or there's like a sister wife situation going on. There. Yes. <laughs> yeah. She was raised Mormon. And... <laughs> um, okay. So yeah. So some gray area uh, then in this idea, because I like, I'll hear people say, yeah, Jeff, you mentioned there's this idea of a, if an unbelieving spouse leaves um, a believing spouse. And in there, I think there's the, like there's some word that can be um, uh, uh, defined as or translated as abandoned. So we'll kind of come to this sort of, okay, abandonment. If you've been abandoned by your spouse. Now, I from from my understanding of Scripture and the limited st- – study I got in before this podcast, like, I think it's literal abandonment, like they're up and gone. Um, I'm leaving you, whatever, then that believing spouse, okay, they're, they're without fault in the divorce. Uh, and there's, they are allowed to remarry in that, in that point. But some people say, well, if they're just abandoned, like if the, the unbelieving spouse becomes emotionally detached or, um, (laughs) define the abandonment. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so I feel like it, broadens the scope do we have that flexibility to assume on scripture what it what it might mean um or or do because i think this is where the i don't know if we're going to get like to a very clear definition of what's allowed and what's not um because i I believe that the, the more important conversation is um, what can we do to never divorce? Um, if God hates it, like, yeah. so how do we pursue living in that commitment? Um, but it, it feels like a lot of the times it, it's almost like we're trying to find reasons to um, uh, allow it, <laughs> allow it yeah. to ju- justify is the word I was going for to, to, to yeah. justify, well, I want to get married or, God told me, like, I have freedom here, like, because I married the wrong per- person. I believe God's leading me down this path because I found the right person. I mean, what's, Well, the what's grass is only greener because someone else is watering it, bud. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> well, I think the only yeah. – because there are some tough situations. I, I agree that most – a lot of people want to justify why they should be getting a divorce opposed to working through their differences. But I think the one situation that is kind of hard is physical abuse and violence. It's usually the angry dude at the wife because, and, and I've heard, um, you know, people say, well, it's not sexually, sexual immorality. So I guess we have to stay together. And th- those are, that's hard, right? Not that God can't redeem that, but you, you obviously want to pursue safety. And I think separation makes sense in a situation like that as we seek repentance and guidance and restoration, if God's going to be a part of it. But I don't know. God, God can redeem a lot. Yeah, I was in a situation at a church um, where, where I was pastor, and I was counseling a lady who um, was going through what was being abused um, 
but it was a lot of verbal and emotional abuse, not so much mm -hmm. physical. And, um, I have had those times where I've talked to somebody like, and, and you know, the, the recommendation is always, I encourage you to separate now, be safe, and then we can kind of work through. But, um, she was asking, well, what about divorce? Do I have the, the freedom here? Like, like, what does that look like? I have friends saying you should just dump this guy, but it seems like scripture saying, um, that I don't have the freedom in that. And I said, well, yeah, like, I think m my understanding of scripture is that you're, you're a believer. He claims to be a believer. Um, but there's, there's all this abuse and if, and she was worried it would lead to something else. And, but she came to this determination of, I'm not going to divorce him. I, I think I'm called to love him even in the middle of this, but I'm not going to stay with him. We'll, we'll separate. And, and she told him, I will not, I will, I'm not going to pursue divorce. If you want it, you pursue it. Um, but I'm not going to be the one that, that, that does that. But I'm also not going to live in the same house as, as you, as long as you treat me this way. She went a long time in that situation. Um, when everyone else would be like, you have the right, you have the right to leave. You have the right to leave. Now it didn't work out to where he turned around, right? There. It was a long road, long path, um, where a lot of, a lot of other details, but, I, I was always proud of her for coming to a point of saying, I, cause I, I would, no one would blame her. No one would blame her for stepping out. Um, but as she walked away from scripture, you know, her thought was, well, I've, I've committed to this person. Let no one separate it. Let nothing separate it except for death. And there's not infidelity. There's abandonment. You could say, um, there, there is abuse. And so, remove yourself to safety, but man, she was committed to, to trying to be a godly wife in a very difficult situation. I just don't think we hear or see that a lot. And I don't want to say it's super easy. I'm a guy. I've been married for 20 something years. I got a great relationship. My parents have been married for 50 years. We just had their 50th anniversary. Um, I've got grandparents and family and a brother that have been through divorce. So I understand that. And, and so I don't want to come across insensitive, like just stick it out. Um, but I was proud of her for having that type of, uh, view of her marriage. That would, you There's know, a lot of things that aren't explicit. Yeah. Um, and I think we have to kind of make some, I, I don't want to use the word assumptions, but some good discernment as we read scripture, because, um, obviously Jesus teaches that, you know, adultery breaks that bond, unties that, that marriage a lot, but, or not, but that, um, you know, the idea of remarriage isn't something that, um, you know, he really digs into there as, as he's teaching that. But the assumption is, um, you know, when he's teaching about it in, in Matthew five is that, you know, a woman who, uh, is divorced will remarry. And Jesus seems to say, well, you know, unless your first marriage was dissolved by adultery, then that makes you your second marriage an adulterer. Um, so we have to read those things and make that discernment. And then as we think about, um, you know, what is sexual sin or what is abandonment? Um, one, I think there's a lot of things that can fit into those categories more than just sexual sin is cheating on your spouse or abandonment is your spouse leaving. Um, but at the same time, I think we could, we have to be careful with that because we can justify a lot of reasons for divorce because we say, oh, well, technically this falls under this category. Um, I think the point goes back to God hates divorce. He's not making it easy on purpose because, you know, as this lady's testimony that you just shared, Josh, um, God can work through anything. Now it's not to dismiss anyone who has been divorced and was in a bad relationship or bad situation and has remarried. Um, because I know people that have gotten divorced and then gotten remarried and they have very God honoring relationships in their second marriage. But I think that, um, we are quick to give up as human beings and, uh, not try to, to plow that hard road sometimes that we need to with the support of God trying to do the right thing, trying to honor him. And uh, I, I think that's why we have to be careful as we take some of these things that are said and we piece all this together and just assume, oh, well, this makes it okay for me to divorce and remarry. Um, you know, read the intention and the heart behind this and then 
pray through it and say, you know, if, if you're in this situation, is this, um, you know, me doing what is best in terms of honoring and glorifying God? Um, you know, and if, if it's hard to answer a yes to that, then you got to rethink it and uh, really look to see what he's leading you to do in that situation. Mm -hmm. And and I think a lot of times people don't really fully understand the, the sacredness of marriage. Um, You know, there's two institutions that God created. You've got the church and marriage. Chicago bears. And the Chicago Bears, um, Thank you. which, you know, Dick he hasn't done a great job, I guess, of really making that work. Um, the Bears, the Bears. Uh, um, so 85 so, was the best year I've ever lived. One of these days, maybe you'll get to experience that again <laughs> if you live to be 85. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, when you think about marriage, like the there's there's a divine purpose for it. And your marriage, if you're a believer, your marriage is meant to, you know, d- display a couple things about who God is and who we are as his, as his um, children, that it shows the way Jesus loves his people so unconditionally. Um, the way we love our spouse is to display that and the way the, his people follow him willingly. Um, that idea of wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord is to communicate just this willing submission to someone who loves us unconditionally and deeply. And so the marriage is, it's been said that marriage is not to make us happy. It's to make us holy. And so it's a sanctifying union. So it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And as we love each other through really difficult things and forgive each other of things that the world normally wouldn't forgive, we're showing this, this love and forgiveness that Jesus offers inside our marriage. So I, that's one of those things that, that as a Christian, it's hard to, um, or as, as someone in marriage, but I'd say even as a Christian, we, we carry this weight of responsibility, not just to, you know, make ourselves happy in a marriage, um, but to display to the world that there's a commitment here, that Jesus loves you no matter what. And so I'm going to forgive my spouse the same way Jesus forgave me. And, and I think that's a big part of it, like extending... And even in, in in places of infidelity, and again, I'm speaking to something I haven't been through in a marriage, so I know I I, I can't I can't empathize with how difficult that might be. But that story you mentioned, the story of Hosea, like showing how God continued to forgive and bless and show grace and mercy to His people, even though they had divorced Him, and and then Jesus coming, it's the same way. While we were His enemies and turned from Him. He gave his life, showed his love for us. And so in marriage, we're, we're called to love to that extent. I mean, in all things, we're called to love to that extent. But marriage is one of those things that, that God said, this specifically is the way that people in the world will, will look at two people who are following Jesus and love him, coming together to be one person, and nothing's going to separate them except death. Uh, but because you guys are sinners, if this happens, all right. Uh, but but we don't think about it from that from that point. Listen, my I've got a story such that you know I and I think all of us as guys, but um, who are married can can relate to this. But like my wife has been given plenty of reason to leave me, and she has shown grace after grace after grace, or upon grace upon grace upon grace, and shows clearly her unconditional love for me. Um, and, you know, so we've made it 20 years. I think about my parents, the exact same thing. And 50 years, we just celebrated that. My parents renewed their vows um, at their at their anniversary celebration. Amazing thing. Um, and I, I'm not going to tell their story here, but if you know their story, it's, I mean, it's, it's just that where there have been probably these times where they could justify leaving each other, um, but they've loved each other and the legacy that they've left. I think that is something that we need to consider more when we get into these times in our marriages where divorce comes up. Um, that, well, I'm not happy. This person doesn't make me happy anymore, so I'm leaving. And we don't think, well, am I growing in holiness in this marriage, and how can I? Hmm. Well, and my, this is 
spoiler alert, if I'm going to marry anyone who's listening to this podcast, this is kind of my go-to message, but the, the famous Ephesians 5 passage, that husbands... Listen, you're going to officiate the wedding. You're not actually <laughs> no, I'm going to marry, marry you. Else. Okay, because you are married. Yeah. I was like, what? LDS? <laughs> uh, is the that, Northwest. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about Solomon. It's true. <laughs> is Eric uh, about the, this? We've discussed. No, just, <laughs> husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And I think we too quickly say, well, yeah, 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 you know, put her first. But forgetting like the depth at which Jesus loved us. And I think about his sinlessness. So he, like, we're sinners. He's not. We deserve death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We deserve death. We're the sinners. But to suffice God's anger and wrath against humanity's sin, he sent his own son to live sinlessly. So Jesus didn't just choose the church to save the church with his death. He chose the church with every minute of every day. I mean, if Jesus sinned one time, salvation is unavailable. The whole plan is ruined. So from the moment he woke up to the moment he went to bed every single day for his 33 odd years of, of life, he chose to love the church first by not sinning. And I think about how, how excruciating his um, you know, last hours on earth were. I mean, even, even if he just thought one ill thought against one of the people who put a nail in his hand or who punched him in the face or who wedged a crown down his scalp and caused blood to go into his eyeballs. I mean, he thought one bad thought against any one person. Salvation is gone. And men are called to love their wives the same way. So I think a lot of people can come in really heavy handed, like women submit to your husbands. Well, this is the kind of submission we're asking. I mean, I would submit myself to, to somebody who loved me with every minute of their day from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed, choosing to put me first. I have no problem submitting to that. Um, yeah. The so I think there's a the husband there. It really is. So I think, you know, it, and I, I agree with you, you know, we, marriage doesn't make you happy. It makes you holy. So don't think about your happiness, what you're getting. But I think on, uh, a lot of people, the Christian holiness movements can think, well, why aren't I feeling more holy? Why aren't I feeling more happy? Who cares? Are you serving your wife? Who cares about you? Yeah. Are you caring about her? My two so, cents. <laughs> um, and I think that's great. Like uh, I, I've I had a friend. Um, no, that's kind of a weird, uh, it's a whole other thing. I know a guy that, um, <laughs> that was talking about this and basically said, if there's still blood in your veins, you haven't loved or forgiven your wife enough. You got yeah. more to do. Yeah. So we do need to wrap, wrap the conversation up. Um, so I do want people to understand, like if you have been divorced mm. and hearing, maybe you're hearing some of this for the first time or clearly, yeah, I think it might be easy for you to um, uh, maybe feel guilty or shame. Mm. Listen, you are loved as much today as you've ever been by your father. And there is grace enough for you. And mm -hmm. the, the encouragement at this point is whatever life is looking like for you, whether you're single or you've remarried, live your life to the glory of the Lord. And if you're in a new marriage, do that. Uh, Bridget's parents divorced when she was 10. Her parents weren't believers. Because of that divorce, her dad began to date a woman who is a believer, and she said, listen, if you're going to date me, you got to go to Bible study with me. It was actually a women's Bible study, so he started going <laughs> and sat in the corner. Came pretty to know smart. Jesus. Yeah, pretty smart. He's like, I'll go. Came to know Jesus, married this woman, led Bridget to faith when she was young. And um, so I'm married now for twenty, almost 22 years to a woman that um, – is so in love with the Lord and treats me that way. I can tell Jesus loves me through her. Um, and that's a result of the divorce. Now, I don't want to say she wouldn't have come to faith because our, our Calvinist lis listeners out there, you know, it would have happened anyways, right? But there, I see this pathway. And it's not to say, hey, good things can come from divorce. It's to say God redeems all things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. something that happened that was negative – um, that might may have been something that God hated. It doesn't mean he's still at work or can't restore it. So there is hope and uh, God does still love you. And then another thing, listen, consider singleness as a gift. Maybe you've been through that and you're single. Maybe that's something that God's saying, this is where you should be. Just things to think through in that. 
Um, you guys have any final thoughts or anything else you want to say? I know it's a this is a huge topic, mm-hmm. and we could probably talk for a long, long time on it. Anything else we we need to say before we wrap up, though? I would just, you know, as a reminder, Josh, you touched on it, is that reconciliation and forgiveness should mark the believer's life. And uh, so that is the pursuit uh, first and foremost. But obviously, um, you know, there are there are circumstances in which, um, you know, you, you've forgiven, you've tried reconciliation and the other person uh, obviously does not want to. Um, and so, um, you know, I'd echo what Josh said for those that have been divorced and gone through this, not making light of it, not saying it's easy and, uh, you know, would never pretend to say that at all. Um, but, uh, you know, God can use it as, you know, Josh has shared in, in this testimony of, of his wife. And, uh, that's the beauty of God is that, uh, he, he forgives and he, uh, can use anything. Um, so as we talk about God and what he can do, uh, you see him using all kinds of broken situations to bring, uh, just amazing and beautiful things to life. And so that's the key to remember, uh, in the God that we serve. Mm-hmm. It's true. And I, I would say if I could offer just any, you know, passing word of encouragement on the subject, I think that no one, no one, no other person can make can tell you whether it's 100% right or 100% wrong for your situation if you're considering divorce. But I would say that divorce is not something that should be considered lightly or quickly or rash or anything like that. But in that same, to- you know, of the same token, marriage is also not something that you should sec- consider lightly or with, you know, haste. I think it's something that they're both things that we need to consider seriously and the implications of that. And, you know, you're also the leading of the Holy spirit in those situations. I think those are all important things to think of when you're thinking about these subjects in your own life. That's a great point. So 75% of divorces are because of a lack of commitment, which we discussed in the first part should be something that's handled on the front end. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think people do rush into it. Marriage is valuable. It's important. Culture downplays it. There's a TV show out now. I know we got to got to end, but I just got to say that there's a TV show out right now um, that Bridge and I have, uh, or she's watched. <laughs> I, I'm telling on her. I shouldn't say this because you're going to judge her. I forget what it's called, but uh, Marriage at First Sight or something. And um, they take these people and they go through all these tests and all these you know personality assessments. There's actually even a, a pastor of some sort involved. But the first time they meet is at the front of a church for a wedding and um, for their wedding. And then they get to know wow. each other. And um, it stuff like that, y'all, marriage is just, I think it devalues what that is. Um, it, and we talked about why it has value. So yeah, consider it. And, it, and if, you're, if you're in that tough spot, you're married, things are going hard, you're considering divorce, talk to a pastor find wise counsel from people who love you and will speak truth to you and who are also doing all they can to follow Jesus. Um, <laughs> your, your friend, your social friends, I would just say hit the road. You know, there's somebody like, don't listen to that. Do the work you can. God will redeem it. And I think you'll see amazing things on the other end. It may not be what you think it should be, but God will work. Thank you guys for joining us uh, for Dude Facts, this week, next week, we'll hit another topic. In fact, can we just go ahead and say what our topic is for next time and give a warning? We texted about this stuff. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> so next week, um, what does the Bible say about sex? What? Sex. S-E-X. Can you hear it? I don't, I don't want to offend people. <laughs> I think there's a song about that. We have to cue that up for next week. I think uh, I think there is um, a Christian song. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> so next week, our topic will be a little more adultish, right? So I don't think we have any 13 year old kids listen, but if we do, my son, no, Silas, my son, listen to it. So, so Silas, 
<laughs> Kev's got you covered, buddy. That's right. <laughs> so that's our topic next week. <laughs> oh, it's going to get a lot of use next week. That topic. <laughs> We're going to have so many sound That's our topic next time. So just prepare yourself. Um... We are generally family friendly. This one might, no. and we're not making light of it. <laughs> no, we, we really are. We're gonna say, what does the Bible say about sex, porn, <laughs> and the big M? That's where we're going next time. So, mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes, <laughs> the monkey. biggest M, mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're out. See you guys next time. <laughs>